Okay, so in this video, we're going to talk about a really important concept in EC45, and that is the concept of a frequency response. Okay, I know you don't know, you might not know what that is yet, um, but we're going to define it in this video and talk about it a little bit. And right now, we're just going to be looking at the frequency response specifically for RLC circuits. And then once we get to the concept of LTI systems, uh, in a couple videos from now, uh, we'll look again at the frequency response for LTI system. But for now, just RLC circuits. So what is the setup? Well, we're going to have some box that I'm going to use to represent some RLC circuit. And then I need an input. So I'll hook up the input as a voltage source that goes in. And then I'll measure the voltage drop across some component in the circuit and call that my output voltage. Okay, and right now we're looking at circuits in sinusoidal steady state. Okay, so I'm gonna hook up a sinusoidal voltage source in particular. Okay, so that V, oh, I labeled them both as VO, VI. So that input voltage source there, it's just gonna be some general sinusoid. So it's gonna have some amplitude, it's gonna have some frequency and it's gonna have some phase. Okay. All right, so now what is our goal for this video? Well, we want a way to describe the relationship between the input and the output, an input-output relationship. Okay, we want a way to understand that and describe it and that's going to lead us to this concept of a frequency response. So let me just write that down. We want to describe the input output relationship between the input time signal and the output time signal. And we want to see how this IO relation, input output relation, varies with the frequency omega. Okay, so you could imagine that for different values of omega here, the circuit might react differently, right? Um, maybe for some values of omega, the circuit you know, increases the amplitude of my input. Maybe for other ones that, you know, add something to the phase of my sinusoid, right? Maybe for others, it decreases the amplitude and subtracts something from the phase. Okay, you can imagine for different values of omega, the circuit will react differently. In particular, that makes sense because the impedance of inductors and capacitors, it has an omega in it, right? J omega L or one over J omega C. So that impedance would change depending on the frequency omega. So it makes sense that we should be looking at how the circuit reacts, how the circuit changes the input into the output, depending on different omegas, different frequencies that we put in. Okay, so we're gonna be looking at phasers here. So let me just summarize the phaser relationship. So in the time domain, as we say, the time functions, we have VI and VO. And then as I said, and I think in the last video, uh, for the phasers, we're going to use this double arrow notation, and I'm going to make my phasers be capitalized. So capital VI and capital VL. Okay, and we know in particular our input phaser here is A e to the J phi, because you can see we our amplitude of our input sinusoid is A, and then the phase is phi. So this is just converting that to a phaser. Okay, so everything is super general here. I didn't say what the circuit was, right? I didn't say what all these variables in the input were. Okay, but we know that using the phaser method that we went over in the last video, we know we're going to get something that looks like this. We know the output phaser is going to end up being the input phaser times, and I'll just write it in words here, some complex function of omega. Okay, so who knows what it is? Okay, maybe we use a voltage divider, maybe we combine some of those impedances that are in series, we combine them first, then use a voltage divider, who knows what we do, we analyze the circuit, but at the end of the day, oops, 
at the end of the day, uh, we know that we're going to get a relationship that looks like this. Okay, that's kind of one of the reasons why the phaser method works, because we're in sinusoidal steady state, we know the output is going to be some sinusoid, so there's going to be some phaser associated with it. That's this one. And we can take our input phaser and use some of the um, you know, circuit analysis methods we've learned to express the output in terms of the input time. Some complex function of omega, that complex is kind of like maybe it's a complicated function, but also it could be complex valued, okay? Because the impedances could be complex numbers. All right, and this is actually all we need to define the frequency response. So we call this function the frequency response. Okay, and it's the frequency response of the circuit. Okay, so frequency response is like a property of this RLC circuit. And it's that function that you multiply the input phaser by to get the output phaser. Okay, and we give a name to this, we use capital H of omega. Okay, and it makes sense that this should be a function of omega based on what we said before. We wanna see how it varies with omega. For different omegas, right? The value of this function when I plug in different omegas could be different, right? Because who knows, there's a J omega L in there maybe. So different values of omega would produce different values for this whole function, okay? So that's the frequency response, that's the definition, okay? And just to put it in sort of one nice clean line, i.e. we're saying the output phaser, just rewriting the line above, is the input phaser times the frequency response, okay? So that's the relationship. And I'll just make a note here that's pretty obvious, but just to have it written somewhere, okay? This means the frequency response is going to be the output phaser divided by the input phaser. Okay, and the reason I write this is that this can be useful uh, if you ever have to calculate H of omega, right? So if you ever are given a circuit, you have to calculate H of omega, maybe in a particular instance, maybe omega is two or something, you can find the input phase or find the output phase or divide them. And in some, you know, example problems, that can be a useful way to go, okay? So that's what we have so far. Um, but we want to kind of understand more about what H of omega does. All your, already from this equation, you can kind of see sort of what it's doing. It's somehow taking our input phaser and sort of converting it into the output phaser, specifically by this multiplication operation. But let's look at kind of how all this stuff is related in the time domain, because then I think you'll see even more clearly exactly what the frequency response H of omega is telling us. Okay. So let's, for the case that I described above, for this general sinusoid, A cosine omega T plus V, let's actually find what this output phaser would be in terms of the frequency response. Okay, so the output phaser in our case, is going to be A times E to the J V. Okay, that was the input phaser I had. Okay. Uh, times the frequency response, which I'm going to write as the magnitude times e to the j phase, just writing the frequency response in polar form. Okay, and why would I do that? Well, it's because I want to look at this output phaser in polar form. I wanna see it as a phaser so I can easily convert back to time. So I can group these terms together, a times the magnitude of the frequency response times e to the j phi plus the angle of the frequency response. And now this is great because look, I have my magnitude and I have my phase of my output phaser. So in the time domain, what do I get for V sub O of T? Well, we know we just have to unphaserize this phaser. So I have my magnitude, A times the magnitude of the frequency response times cosine of what? Well, remember with phasers, we know that this omega t is going to stay the same. The output, the frequency of the output will be the same as the input. So I have my omega t. And then I have to add to it this phase from my v sub o phaser. And there you go. So that's my output. And I'm just going to summarize this and then we'll look at it really closely to understand exactly what the frequency response is doing. So in summary, I put in this generic sinusoid. Put that into 
I need some more room here, I think. Okay, I put that into my RLC circuit. And what we tend to do is we tend to write H of omega, the frequency response inside this box. And that says that the frequency response of this RLC circuit, or more generally, when we get to LTI systems of whatever system we're looking at is H of omega, okay? This is just some sort of notation. And then the output is what we just wrote there. So it's A times the magnitude of H of omega times cosine of omega T plus V plus the angle of H of omega. Okay, so let's step back and look at this for a second. So what is the frequency response telling us? What is H of omega telling us? Well, we know H of omega is a complex number as a magnitude times e to the j phase. And so let's look at what's happening. We put an input, input sinusoid in. What sinusoid did we get out? Well, we got essentially the same thing we put in except for two key changes. One of those changes was that the amplitude of our output is the amplitude we started with, but multiplied by the magnitude of the frequency response. Okay, so that's one thing the frequency response does. Frequency response magnitude tells us how much to multiply the magnitude of our input sinusoid by to get the magnitude of our output sinusoid. What else did it tell us? Well, let's look at the phase now. The phase started out as phi, and what's the phase of the output? Well, it's phi plus the angle of the frequency response. So that's the second thing the frequency response tells us. It tells us that the output phase is just the input phase, but with the angle, the phase of the frequency response added to it. Okay, so these are the two things the frequency response tells us. And it sort of makes sense because the frequency response is a complex number. And we know complex numbers sort of encode two real numbers, the magnitude and the phase. And now we're seeing exactly how those numbers, the magnitude and phase of the frequency response, play a role in the input-output relation for this circuit. Okay, so let me just write that down because that's a really important point. So the magnitude of the frequency response tells you how much to multiply, multiply the input amplitude by. by and the angle of the frequency response or the phase of the frequency response tells you how much to add to the input phase. Okay, so those are the two key things that the frequency response of a circuit tells you. Okay, and you can see that with this relationship we derived. And you can even see that from up here, right? Because VO, that's like the magnitude of the output times e to the j phase of the output, okay, of the output phaser divided by the magnitude of the input times e to the j magnitude of the input phaser. And so if I just combine this a little bit, I get the magnitude of the output over the magnitude of the input times e to the j phase of the output minus phase of the input. I'm gonna erase this in a second. I just wanna make a point by it. Okay, so what is this telling us? It's telling us the magnitude of h of omega, right? If I multiply that by my input phase, by my input phasor magnitude, I get the output phasor magnitude. That's exactly what it is, right? I take my input phasor magnitude, multiply it by the magnitude of h of omega, I get the output magnitude, right? So you can see it in this relationship right here, the division of the phasors. It's doing exactly what we wrote down below. I mean, it's how we got the thing down below, so it makes sense. And also you can see up here, if I add the phase of the frequency response to the input phase, I get the output phase, right? The phase of the frequency response is just the difference between the output phase and the input phase. Here's the output phase, subtract the input phase. There you go, you get the phase of the frequency response. So kind of looking at all these relationships from all these different angles can help you in problems depending on you know, what inputs to the problem you're given. Um, but it also can help you kind of connect these ideas and see how they're all related to each other. So I think I'll erase this for now because we essentially already wrote it in the time domain. I think you get the idea. Um, but I just wanted to use that to illustrate. So, okay, so that is what the frequency response is. And we're gonna be using this the rest of the quarter right now, just for RLC circuits, but more generally when we get to LTI systems, we'll come back to this topic as well. So great, that's all I have for this video. I will see you in the next one.